Welcome to the Leopoldinas International Virtual Panel Series. The German National Academy of Sciences Leopoldina started this series in summer 2020 to discuss pressing issues with international partners from a scientific perspective. Today, the Leopoldina is very delighted to cooperate with the Academy of Science of South Africa, the Ethiopian Academy of Sciences, the Senegal Academy of Science and Technology, and the UK Academy of Medical Sciences. The five academies originally planned an in-person workshop on infectious diseases in spring 2020 in Berlin, which unfortunately has to be forwarded to a later date due to the current COVID-19 pandemic. The panel today bridges the gap with a virtual scientific dialogue on infectious diseases. My name is Jan Nissen, and on behalf of the organizing academies, I warmly welcome you to the virtual panel COVID-19 and multimorbidity, how to deal with multiple infectious diseases in parallel. We look forward to an exciting discussion among the panelists and of course with you, the worldwide audience. And now I have the pleasure to pass over to Ms. Vivian Uppmann, a German freelance science journalist and moderator who will moderate this panel today. I also asked the speakers to turn on their audio and video. Welcome, everyone. Yeah, I'm Vivian Uppmann. As uh, Jan Nissen already said, I'm a German journalist and um, I'm the presenter to, uh, for today. And it's an honor to be here with all of you. We are discussing a global topic today, and it's amazing that we are welcoming our worldwide audience, you, from about 35 countries. I also want to welcome our renowned speakers who will discuss and analyze their perspectives from different countries and continents. Thanks for being with us. Our topic is COVID-19 and multimorbidity, how to deal with multiple infectious diseases in parallel. A central question for many people living in areas with high rates of infectious diseases is what happens when COVID-19 meets other infectious diseases, such as HIV, tuberculosis and malaria. We will talk about the developments of COVID-19 drugs and vaccines in general, but also about the question how multimorbidity can be considered in the development and application of drugs and vaccines. How can scientists advise politics and society on coping with the issue of COVID-19 and multimorbidity? And what can we learn from experiences made during the COVID-19 crisis? If you, the audience, have any questions, please use our Q&A function, which will be open for you throughout the whole event. The chat cannot be used, but our team will collect your questions from the Q&A function. So feel free to ask. You will neither be unmuted or broadcasted with video. We will forward your written questions to our panelists through, uh, during our Q&A function and section. Um, since my role is only to present these interesting topics, I'm more than happy to hand over to the real protagonists. Professor Kureisha Abdul Karim, member of the Academy of Science of South Africa, Center for the AIDS Program of Research in South Africa, Doris Duke Medical Research Institute in Durban, South Africa. As our first speaker today, please tell us about your experiences with COVID-19 and other contagious diseases. Thank you very much, Vivian, and greetings to all the participants and uh, my co-panelists. It's a real honor and privilege um, despite this very challenging times that we're living in, uh, that we are gathered here together, representing multiple um, science academies and looking at the role of science and, uh, and, and how we can contribute to one of the biggest challenges facing us uh, in 2020 and likely to continue in 2021. So I think undoubtedly we've learned the importance and centrality of science. We've learned the importance and critical need for good scientific communication. And we've also appreciated better uh, in the context of COVID-19 and this pandemic, uh, how interdependent we are. And I think that uh, one of the big, uh, um, and unprecedented uh, observations is 
how much of knowledge has been generated so rapidly. And uh, as Vivian, you mentioned, uh, my background uh, is in HIV, AIDS, and TB. And um, we still have uh, large pandemics of these infections, including malaria and sub-Saharan Africa, for example, of the um, 1.7 million new infection, HIV infections that occurred in uh, 2019, about 70% of those infections were in sub-Saharan Africa. Further, we find that women are more vulnerable to HIV and young women between the ages of 15 to 24, although they account for 10% of the population, have about one in four infections. Now, HIV and TB are very interrelated. And we know that with advancing HIV disease and pre the development of antiretroviral treatment was a very common and the most common opportunistic infection that we encountered. So as we started to hear about the COVID-19 epidemic, in China, in Europe, and in North America, our big concerns were what will happen when COVID encounters HIV, when we have a big TB epidemic and malaria epidemic. And I think that um, while we look at the global numbers of infection, um, there was a lot of surprise that the epidemic in Africa is not as severe as what we saw in the first wave in Europe and North America, for example. And instead, what we have been able to see is um, not prevention of the spread of COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, but what we've been able to see is uh, much lower levels and much lower death rates. And I think that this is because we've benefited a lot from the knowledge and experiences of countries that saw epidemics earlier, experienced epidemics earlier. And in addition, I think in Africa, our preparedness and investments that were made to respond to HIV and TB held us in good stead in terms of responding rapidly, building our testing capacity in terms of contact tracing, et cetera. But very importantly, I think what we learned in this epidemic is that while we're dealing with an infectious organism, that this organism particularly sought out a different type of vulnerability. So we knew about age and we thought initially that this was a respiratory illness. Well, we learned very quickly that this is a disease from head to toe and that it wasn't just age, but it was also obesity, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. And so suddenly our world of infectious diseases is uh, converging with non-communicable diseases, which since the 1990s globally has been a growing burden. So unfortunately, despite this unprecedented um, knowledge that's been generated, exciting news about vaccines, we are starting to see second waves of the epidemic in many countries, which look worse than the first wave. And I hope that um, as we continue to generate new knowledge, our ability to translate that into access and affordable access will help us globally to change this picture. And hopefully when we meet in 2022, we can meet with much optimistic scenarios. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Croatia, for sharing these insights and your knowledge with the audience. Um, in case of additional questions, dear audience, please do not hesitate to use our Q&A function, which I already see you're using. So keep on if you want to. And um, I'm pretty sure you are as excited as I am to hear our next amazing speaker, Professor Juan Rosen Imonyu from the College of Health Sciences Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia. Juan Rosen, you have personal experience in managing severe uh, COVID-19 cases who had HIV-1 uh, HIV infections. Could you give us some insights from your Ethiopian experience, please? 
Yes, Th thank you very much for providing me this opportunity. I mean, the interaction between uh, COVID and uh, HIV is a very contentious issue. And I'm, I'm going to share with you one case whom I saw recently. And unfortunately, a patient passed away. And this was uh, a 53 years old gentleman who had HIV for 12 years. And his symptoms were lingering on for, for uh, more than two weeks, you know, with uh, hoarseness of voice, cough, fever, loss of appetite. And eventually when he presented to us, he presented with marked weight loss. He lost more than 10 kilograms in, uh, in two months time. So we thought that he had uh, treatment failure and that was our impression because he was poorly adherent to his first line regimen and the patient was on his second line regimen. His first line regimen was a combination of Combivir and Efavirenz and then uh, because he had a virologic failure, seven years back, we put him on tenofovir, lamivudin, atzanavir, ritonavir combination. And because of uh, his previous poor treatment adherence history, uh, my initial consideration was treatment failure. And when I did, you know, I requested for CD4 count and HIV viral load and the HIV viral load results the CD4 result came before the, the, I had the HIV viral uh, load result. And three months back, his CD4 count was 350. I'm just presenting the challenge. And now his CD4 count was 65 yeah, in three months time. So it was just a precipitous drop. And what really happened was it's not only the absolute CD4 count, but the CD4 percentage was, was also low. It was only 6%. So my initial consideration was he had failed with his second line treatment because of the precipitous drop in his CD4 count. Then, you know, he had TB, TB history of TB treatment some 12 years back. Then I immediately before I had uh, the viral result shifted him to a third line regimen, a combination of dolutegravir Darunavir, Ritonavir, and, and Lamivudin. And some, you know, three days later, the HIV viral load result came and it was undetectable. And then I asked myself, because the patient said he did not have cough, but fever, and, 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 uh, and later on shortness of breast developed, we took a CT scan and the CT scan was suggestive of uh, COVID, severe COVID. However, the RT-PCR for COVID test was, was negative. So the challenge I faced was, you know, this is a patient who had a precipitous drop in his CD4 count. And paradoxically, his HIV viral load was determined twice and it was undetectable. So we thought of uh, a treatment failure and later on, you know, because the chest CT scan was really compatible with severe COVID, then I convinced myself this is because of uh, the precipitous drop was because of COVID. And, uh, and on the chest X-ray, on the chest CT scan, it was it was uh, uh, the findings were suggestive of severe COVID. However, it was very difficult on the background of, uh, you know, his very low CD4 count and to rule out other opportunistic infections and then like PCP and then tuberculosis and then and, and also superimposed bacteria pneumonia. And the treatment we managed him as a, as a severe COVID case and then and, and we gave him dexamethasone. I just put him back on his second line regimen and then PCP treatment and then the Eventually, patients' uh, oxygen saturation progressively fall down, and eventually uh, he passed away. So the challenge, you know, this is the only case who had, you know, such such uh, such uh, such uh, perplexing presentation because the others infected with COVID, you know, interestingly enough, our patients are younger and have low BMI. 
and in the number of them, comorbidities are less. And in most of them co-infected with COVID, the outcome is, 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 is not in any way different from the patients non-infected with COVID. So what's going to be the challenge now from my point of view is because of the CD4 count drop, and fortunately enough, in this case, the viral load was detectable, undetectable. Suppose, you know, when we face patients who had uh, who are going to have detectable viral load, and in view of the fact that having, you know, COVID can lead to a fall in the T helper cell count. So my own worry, and, and I suppose this would be also a good research uh, agenda, is to see the relationship between the outcome of the disease in relation to having detectable viral load and 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 falling CD4 count. Okay. So if there are questions in relation to the case and in our experience, I'm very willing to, to respond to. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Von Rossen. Wow, after those two very interesting speeches, let's take a step back from case-based experiences to challenges of managing long-term chronic health conditions. Do we have to change our management systems in general in face of evolving patterns of multimorbidity? This question requires an expert to answer it. Let's ask Professor Peter Cavalier, member of the UK Academy of Medical Sciences from the Institute of Aging and Chronic Disease, University of Liverpool, United Kingdom. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, in some senses, I almost feel like a fraud in this com company because you've got experts really in infectious diseases and the focus of this meeting is really the interaction between having multiple infectious diseases. But I think it is right to consider the possibility of other non-infectious diseases. Uh, if you will cut to the chase and say that there's abundant evidence that having multiple infectious diseases as having multiple non-infectious diseases increases uh, the mortality and worsens the outcome for patients. Uh, multimorbidity, which is what we are now calling this entity, has been a concern for the Academy of Medical Sciences in the UK really for the last five years, particularly when we realized that this was a global issue. Uh, and that led us to develop a series of documents following from meetings in South Africa uh, and also with the BRICS countries and Sub-Saharan Africa. But the key document perhaps was the one that I contributed to, to which was a longer one about multimorbidity, a priority for global research. I think our perspective on this is that multimorbidity is usually studied in relationship to non-communicable diseases, a, a different context from what we're looking at here. And it's been very much, the best data has been available in countries with relatively high eco productive economies. There's been an enormous debate about how to define this, which as usual, when you've got problems with defining things, means that you can't really make progress. But it's now accepted that you can include both physical and mental illnesses in multimorbidity from a patient's perspective. And it does cover acute illnesses along with chronic disease, which can coexist. And of course, in this meeting, we've already heard about the problems of somebody with tuberculosis and HIV and potential uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, the terminology around multiple multimorbidity, however, has been relatively confusing. And so although everybody agrees it's important, we've had trouble defining it. Uh, we spent a lot of time in our working group doing that, and the definition we came up with is slightly different from perhaps what you might imagine. It's the coexistence of two or more chronic conditions each one of which is either a physical non-communicable disease of long duration, for instance, a cardiovascular disease, post-tuberculous lung damage, cancer, anything like that, a mental health condition of long duration, a mood disorder, dementia, or an infectious disease of long duration. And we've already spoken about HIV, but hepatitis C is another possibility. So really what you're dealing with with uh, coronavirus too is a new infection on top of somebody with that background of problems. 
comorbidity, which is another term that's been used a lot, is the coexistence of other conditions which actually directly relate to that index condition. I'm a respiratory physician with an interest in COPD, so I know that people with COPD can develop osteoporosis because of the treatment. It's a comorbid condition along with the COPD. Multimorbidity is when you've got several conditions existing together. Uh, there's no doubt that multimorbidity increases with age, and therefore it's a particular problem of aging populations, and that may be rather different from the pattern of populations who get acute infections. There have been a series of uh, research priorities outlined for low and middle income countries, which we've worked on, uh, basically trying to define what data is available. For instance, uh, existing sources of data which will assess the, the suitability of multimorbidity research need to be identified. We need to understand what are the problems in a local context specific way and what are the risk factors for multimorbidity. It would be good to know if primary prevention were possible, but most important, I think, is defining what works in your own country for you. And that's really, in terms of managing the problems, developing simple, scalable, technologically appropriate uh, ways of delivering care. And ultimately, you need to know how much of this is all going to cost. So there's a series of research options I think South Africa has very much led the way in this, however. They developed something called the Practical Approach to Care Kit, PAC. It came out of work from the translation unit at the University of Cape Town. It provides a very accessible, evidence-based approach to managing common clinical situations that takes account of coexisting disease as well as acute problems, and it's been shown to work. And there's a similar uh, into, as African program called Prime, which is looking at the same ideas for mental health care. That seems to be effective, but it's also compared with PAC relatively expensive and a work in progress. Therefore, ultimately, I think we've got evidence that multimorbidity is internationally a widespread problem, but the problems vary from country to country. Uh, you need to develop appropriate methods of integrated care, but most of all, we need more information and research on this topic. And if we can set that in the context of these new and major developing health problems like COVID, that will help us manage the future of our patients better. Sorry. No problem at all. Uh, I was just making sure I didn't overrun, but I forgot my, my timer got stuck. But that's basically uh, the message which I give. Strangely, the UK has a very large number of patients with multimorbidities, and we have one of the worst outbreaks in the world of COVID. But as yet, we've not integrated those two things directly with other infections. But I'm sure we'll talk about that some more in the following discussions. Thanks a lot for sharing your thoughts um, and for answering our question, Peter. We already talked a lot about our topic, COVID-19, but although we are living in a pandemic right now, there are still non-COVID-19 patients. I'm glad to introduce you to Professor Papa Salif So, who is a member of the Senegal National Academy of Sciences and Technology, Infectious Diseases Faculty of Medicine, University of Dakar, Senegal. Salif, you are an expert in global health diplomacy. How are you in Senegal facilitating access to care for non-COVID-19 patients? Uh, thank you very much, Ma Madam Co-Chair Vivian, and uh, thank you to the uh, Leopoldina Academy of Science of Germany. And I would like also to thank my co-panelists uh, for talking on this, uh, regarding this very interesting topic on multimorbidity. Um, I, I will not focus only on Senegal, but uh, as and some physician in Africa trying to reflect uh, during this COVID pandemic, how to ensure the continuity of care uh, for um, you know uh, those who are not not non-COVID patients, and um, uh, I think it is very important to note that we were very all surprised by this pandemic at the beginning in February, March, uh, developed and developing countries. And um, country reacted very early on 
by putting on what was called the non-pharmaceutical intervention, the NPIs, because at the beginning we didn't have uh, treatment, we didn't have vaccine. So the, the only thing that was working was the non-pharmaceutical intervention. And this include um, a national lockdown, this include uh, travel restriction, this include also uh, the stay at home orders. But all these NPIs, these non-pharmaceutical intervention, they have very negative impact on our daily life. And in particular, for those who are seeking care um, it, during this condition uh, with travel restriction. So, um, and when I look at this pandemic in, uh, in, in Africa, in basically in many general countries, the uh, non-physical, non-pharmaceutical intervention um, have a very significant, and the question was how to continue, uh, ensure the continuity of care during this pandemic. Everything is not down, stay at home. But if you are sick with multiple infections like HIV, TB, malaria, even non-COVID di uh, patient, diabetes, hypertension, you cannot stay at home. So this, and um, the thinking was what might be the best way to have the continuity of care. And uh, I just would like to highlight one of the recent WHO study uh, showing that during this lockdown, there was a very significant decrease, 44% um, decline in services, uh, health services attendance. And this was very significant because of the, of the lockdown. And this was not only for HIV, TB, malaria, but this includes also um, immunization services, uh, diabetes services, cardiovascular services, uh, family planning services, 44% because of the uh, lockdown and the stay at home order. And this has also very negative impact on our health services uh, because we were noting disrush, disruption to health services delivery. Uh, people were fear, have fear to attend health services uh, because of fear to be contaminated by uh, COVID-19. Uh, transportation issue was a problem also. Uh, disruption of key medicine because the airport was, um, uh, you know, closure of the airport. We are not receiving medicine from our side. And also in Nigeria, a very recent study was very interesting showing the misconception between COVID-19 and TB patient. If you look at, at the beginning, these two diseases, they have the same, they are coughing and you have fever. And so this situation in this paper from Nigeria shows that they have very negative impact on TB patient staying at home because they were afraid going to the hospital because of um, uh, stigma and uh, discrimination. And now the question is how to help this patient to ensure the continuity of care. I just would like to highlight two strategies. The first one is using what we call now telehealth, using innovative te technology for medicine, telehealth. And the second one, I just highlight two issue, uh, experience in Zambia, how to, uh, they were able to ensure the continuity of care. I, I think we all uh, agree that the, the telehealth was the one approach to ensure the continuity of care because uh, this is a method using a new technology, uh, audio video conferencing or um, uh, telephone and the, the you know, a patient using uh, their smartphone or their computer uh, or their tablet so the patient can uh, use a vid this video audio conferencing with his health providers and to, at least for monitoring and to continue the, 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 the system. I think this is a wonderful experience. It is now implemented in a lot of uh, developed countries and in Africa, some countries are experiencing this telehealth, but it is very limited uh, for many reasons, the term of co because of e connectivity issues in uh, many of our countries. Second, many patients, they don't have a smartphone or having access to computers. But I do believe this is one of the lessons learned, right? like uh, working from home. Um, this one might be a, a very significant game changer, telehealth, using telehealth to manage a patient for multimorbidity or non-COVID patient, diabetes, all, all these things. You can be connected with your 
with your uh, healthcare providers and at least uh, ensure the continuity of, of care. Uh, the second uh, very nice experience in Zambia was they were able to put in place a new strategy, they call it the multi-month dispensing uh, medicine. So giving to the patient six months of treatment instead of once, uh, one month of treatment. Uh, for those who are very stable, like uh, antiretroviral uh, therapy, six month dispensing, uh, for those patients who are very stable, and also even for the diabetes patient. So I think this might be uh, COVID-19 help us to think outside the box and trying to be very innovative. Um, they were also using uh, community uh, workers with, with the PPE and going making the home delivery uh, for those patients who cannot attend the, the service because of the lockdown and the uh, uh, stay at home order. And also other strategies, you know, the, during the weekend uh, and also the after hour care to deliver and to make this thing very easy for patients to, to, to attend. So the, the, Madam Cochet, it was just some ideas on how we can learn from the COVID-19 and how we can from there, even after COVID-19, how we can continue to use telehealth uh, for the continuity of care. This will be very um, uh, cost effective for the health system in Africa. And this will be also very cost effective for our patients. And we need to have a significant collaboration with you know, the telephone company to might be able to implement these um, activities. So in short, to, uh, because of my limited time, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share these um, two uh, strategies that to ensure the continuity of care and avoid complication, deterioration of death or those patients who are really not COVID patients. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Salif, for this optimistic overview. And again, I would like to encourage you, dear audience, to ask your questions in our Q&A function. We dedicated some time to answer them uh, later. Let's now talk about vaccines. Professor Stefan Kaufmann from Max Planck Institute of Infection Biology in Berlin, Germany. We could read in German newspapers that a further developed tuberculosis vaccine um, should also be able to protect against severe causes of COVID-19. If we think the other way around, how does research and development for COVID-19 influences, e.g. tuberculosis, malaria, and AIDS? Could you turn on your microphone, please? I'm sorry. Yeah. Thanks no worries. Very much. Thanks a lot. Um, hi to everybody. Well, these were really excellent talks tonight. And I would like to switch gears slightly, although it's a little bit in the line of uh, Papa Salif, and want to talk a little bit about the interactions between COVID-19 and tuberculosis mostly, but more from a standpoint of societal and political issues, because there are some beneficial effects clearly when these two giants of diseases, infectious diseases meet. But unfortunately, there are also some worrisome events that come out of this, and I would like to discuss that very, very briefly. So let's look at COVID-19. It's caused by a virus. It has spread over our globe with an enormous speed, with 60 million people infected uh, as to now and 1.4 million deaths. It has been sometimes called something like a democratic disease because it affects all people on this globe may are they from uh, low income middle income or high income countries also it looks to me after having talked with some of our panelists today that actually the high income countries seem to be affected even more than low income countries and then on the other side there is tuberculosis an ancient disease with a preponderance clearly in low to middle income countries with 1.7 billion people infected, latently infected, and these people are non-contagious, but 10% um, will develop disease. And on the other hand, there is COVID-19 with many, many people infected already now, but COVID-19 people infected are often healthy, still they are contagious. And I think that's a very, very important point. 
asymptomatic people, individuals are uh, contagious, and that's clearly in contrast to TB. For TB, we already have a vaccine, BCG, Basil calmet guerin It protects neonates, but unfortunately, its protective efficacy is extremely low to marginal uh, against adult tuberculosis, mostly pulmonary tuberculosis. Now, the COVID-19 vaccine pipeline was without precedent. Within half a year or so, three vaccine candidates have success successfully completed recruitment for the trials, phase three trials. And there's a lot of hope now, at least in the uh, high income countries, notably in Europe and in the US, that vaccination will start soon. Although they talk about this year, I guess it will be next year, but this is really an accelerated speed of development and deployment. So how can tuberculosis and COVID-19 interact with each other and how can they benefit from each other? Are there synergisms? Well, I think tuberculosis can provide a lot of information about the basic mechanisms. We heard a little bit about that on the way how to manage at point of care the treatment. But tuberculosis remains underfunded as the others uh, malaria and HIV. COVID-19 has demonstrated that fast, quick intervention strategies can be developed once politics has decided to support financially whatever it will cost. We're talking here about 20 billions at least that come from Europe and the United States and many other countries also contributed it. So here we have something which TB really can learn from in a positive way, how public and politics have engaged in these issues. I would say currently we have and should learn from each other. And whenever I say, I say tuberculosis, I mean HIV, malaria and neglected diseases, but there are also some negative impact, which it may even be detrimental. We hear about the di disruption of TB as well as HIV, malaria, laboratory services, shortages of TB drug supply. We heard that just a minute ago from Papa Salif. Lower TB notification, 25 to 50% of the first half 2020 of TB notification are decreasing, which means these people have TB, but they are not identified, diagnosed as TB patients, which means they will not receive drug treatment. So drug treatment has been reduced, and this really will have a greater impact uh, on the future of TB, HIV, malaria, and I focused on TB. And then, of course, there is also impact on the research and development, notably on clinical trials scarcity of clinical trial sites, deviation of funding for R&D. Let me give you my own experience very shortly. We've developed a vaccine against tuberculosis, a second generation vaccine. It's based on BCG, it's genetically modified, and it has entered at least uh, two phase three trials, both in India. And we wanted to start the phase three trial in neonates from HIV exposed mothers in sub-Saharan Africa. And then COVID came and arrived, and there were clearly delays in getting this all started in time. There's also a positive aspect, actually, because of the uh, alertness of politics. The European Investment Bank decided to support our research with a loan over 30 million euros. So that's quite a remarkable sum, which would never have come up uh, uh, if COVID-19 had not sensitized all those. Now, actually, two days ago, our vaccine trial in Sub-Saharan Africa finally could start, but it shows that clinical trials will be delayed, trial enrollment will be delayed by COVID-19, trial participant monitoring is delayed, ESL3 labs, high security, safety security laboratories are diverted to COVID-19. WHO really has calculated that the decrease of detection of detection and diagnosis of TB of about 50% over a year 
will result in an excess death rate of 1 million. So TB death rates could increase from 1.4 million in 2019 to somewhere between 2 to 2.4 million in 2020. And that is really worrisome. And it not only holds true for TB, similar case can be made for malaria and also for HIV. So I would say if that doesn't change rapidly, then we will have a big problem. And SARS-CoV-2 actually um, will be responsible for more deaths indirectly caused by TB, HIV, um, malaria, and neglected tropical diseases, then really it uh, causes death by itself. And I think this is not acceptable. And I think I will stop here for the sake of discussion time. Thanks a lot. That have been very interesting impulse lectures, very smart ideas, uh, which lead to many other questions, obviously. So as long as our team is collecting your questions, dear audience, which you can still write down, obviously, um, I want to thank all of our panelists for the dense and complex information. And I would like to start the Q&A section with the first question. I um, I want to start like that, as we have heard, it is very important to consider multimorbidity in general. Currently, pharmaceutical companies worldwide work on the development of COVID-19. We heard that, drugs and vaccines. How can multimorbidity be considered in the development of these drugs and vaccines? Maybe I can pass over that question to Croatia. What is your opinion? I think when we look at the drugs that are developed, most of them are developed um, in uh, by pharmaceutical industries in the private sector, and very little of the innovation and development is actually being initiated, uh, particularly in Africa. And so, what we've seen is those diseases that are common in industrialized countries are prioritized for drug development. And uh, those diseases, particularly the infectious diseases that are common in Africa have always lagged behind. The one exception that we have is in HIV. In HIV, we have antiretrovirals and there was a very important starting point for an unprecedented uh, next uh, step in terms of access that occurred through global solidarity and initiatives like the Global Fund for AIDS, TB and Malaria being established, the US Presidential Emergency Program for AIDS Relief. And within a very short space of time with some investments from local uh, and national governments, we are able to uh, make sure that the life-saving drugs, a three combination of three antiretrovirals were as available and accessible and affordable in Africa as it was in other parts of the world. And that's right, because 70% uh, of the burden is actually in Africa. But I think there's an important gap, which is that, um, you know, in uh, it's almost like what we're seeing with COVID-19, because it's a pandemic, there's a democratization of the process in terms of whatever is being developed is likely to benefit across the globe. But on the other hand, already with the vaccines, we're seeing a kind of vaccine nationalism in that those countries that have developed the vaccines are prioritizing the doses of those vaccines for their own populations. And so this disconnect that we have, and so earlier I spoke about interdependence and if we all contribute to the production of knowledge and clinical trials are taking place across the globe, including in Africa, yet when products become available, we have these disconnects. And so it's an important point that while we're thinking about COVID, while we're seeing it as a global challenge, that does it, what opportunities are there to look at other comorbidities that are there, other um, conditions that have remained neglected, like with TB, we haven't made much progress. 
with malaria, some progress again, but there's a multitude of infectious diseases that continue to dominate in low middle income countries and where there's a big gap in terms of drugs. So let me pause there, sorry. Thanks a lot. I saw that you one wasn't turned on your microphone. Are you the same? Um, um, is your opinion the same or would you say something else? Uh, me, I, yes. Thank you. I just want to add two, um, two uh, input, two contribution in addition to what um, uh, Croatia have said. I think the COVID-19 is a wonderful opportunity for other multiple uh, multimorbidity diseases. It's not a risk because we, uh, we can learn from this wonderful advance of science as Professor Ste Stefan said, you know, in, with COVID we, uh, you know, the platform for research was wonderful. The science was here. In less than one year, we were able to do something. I think we can learn from there and to push for uh, the HIV vaccine and to push for the malaria vaccine. A lot of things were done. The second one, um, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, for the vaccine, I think as um, Koraisha said, uh, this is a really global solidarity. And for uh, our countries, a resource limiting setting or developing countries, as they said, the, this initiative, the, the uh, in, uh, international initiative that is called the COVAX, The COVAX is something, and this is funded by developed countries to support accessibility to COVID-19 vaccine for developing countries. And this is managed by the Gavi at Geneva. And to be sure that we in developing countries we will be able to have access to this vaccine free of charge at the same time like a developed country. So I think these are wonderful opportunity for us learning from uh, uh, global solidarity how we can work together because as somebody said, nobody is safe until everyone is safe. Nobody is safe until everyone is safe. So it's global solidarity. We need to work together and trying to see really from COVID-19, how we, um, for our future after COVID, how we can strengthen our collaboration. Thank you, Madam Kochi. Thank you. I, I, I uh, initially saw uh, that um, Von Worsen was turning on the microphone, but I'm totally fine with you answering uh, Papa Salif too. So um, thanks for your initiative and your answer. Um, yeah, as you said, I think a big question is how can we guarantee that the intervention measures against COVID-19 will be distributed fairly globally? Um, what do you think, Von Worsen? Yeah, this is a very challenging question because, you know, particularly in a setting like uh, ours in Africa, where resources are very limited. Like for instance, I was saying for myself that if we get the Pfizer, the Pfizer vaccine, can we distribute it? Because, you know, can we maintain the cold chain minus 70 degrees Celsius? You know, the electricity power is, is always an issue. And you know there are a number of uh, issues that are you know like peace, stability, malnutrition, other co-infections, including HIV, malaria, tuberculosis. So in, you know in a setting like the uh, ours, it's always it's always a challenge, even if you know we have the drugs, and and uh, even if we can manage to obtain the drugs for free. Thanks a lot. As I see already um, a lot of questions from the um, audience coming in, I want to start with those questions too, if you don't mind. Um, there's a first one to Professor Kaufmann. Um, due to the loss of natural habitats, humans and animals are moving uh, ever closer together. How high do you rate the risk that new infectious diseases can be transmitted from animals to humans? Uh, the, the data are very clear. It's about 70% of all newly emerging infections uh, and infectious diseases are coming from the interface between animals and uh, human beings, be that interactions at the wilderness, industrialized farming, 
or markets, but this only leads to an outbreak or in the past has led to outbreaks only. Now with globalization, mobilization, urbanization, outbreaks have much more of a risk to turn into an epidemic and then in a pandemic. And I think that um, we have to take care that this can be controlled. Just to mention, everybody knows that this is not the first outbreak and pandemic of zoonotic um, uh, origin of the millennium of the 20th century, um, uh, 21st century. We had um, Ebola, we had Zika, we had SARS, MERS, and also all the flu uh, strains, um, H1N1, H5N1. Uh, um, none was as contagious and deadly as this one in this combination. So yes, zoonotic diseases are of extreme importance. And I would like to stress really that what we have proposed years ago must now really realize the WHO, for example, in 2005 had the international, international health regulations already, where it was clearly stated surveillance, that's the major issue, surveillance for new outbreaks, for new pathogens, and then transparent and international analysis at the very early stage. You have to have prevalence, uh, surveillance to prevent these things to happen. This is all logarithmic. Once you are over a certain um, number, uh, then, then it is almost uncontrollable or only get, uh, can be get under control with a lot of, lot of expensive um, um, uh, measures. I mean, we're talking here about 350 billion loss of money every month with the COVID-19. So let me just rephrase it again. I think, yes, human animal interactions are clearly a, an important issue. They are of different types. We had the one in Wuhan. And I think the important thing is we have to do surveillance. We cannot start with vaccines, drugs, also this is my area. We have to start very early with surveillance, stop it immediately. Thanks a lot. Um, there are so many questions coming in. I will um, hand over to Peter right now. What impact will long-term effects of a coronavirus infection have on individuals falling ill with other infections? I think that this is going to be one of the new shapes of multimorbidity in the next two decades. Uh, there is little doubt that a significant number of people uh, develop some form of long COVID syndrome. And that the terminology for that is also, like multimorbidity, still developing. But there's no doubt it happens. It comes from a variety of causes. Uh, and it's going to be a persistent problem. At present, we just don't have enough data to know how that is going to shape up. But it is going to be an important feature of the next 20 years. Thank you. There's another question for Croatia. What is the most difficult combination of COVID-19 with another or more communicable disease or diseases in terms of treatment and fatality? So as I said earlier, our knowledge is evolving. It's just a few months uh, experience that we have. So I can speak to what's been published and so on. And, and we're really seeing the, um, uh, the, the non-communicable diseases, um, you know, even diabetes, pre-diabetes and consequences uh, seem to be more common in terms of hospitalization. And I think there's a lot of infections that are taking place. And most of those infections appear to be asymptomatic. We don't quite understand at this point in time, uh, what, who are those people who get so severely ill that they need to be hospitalized. And some of that hospitalizations are taking place during the viremic stage, but the most severe cases we are seeing is when the immune system is being activated. And so that part we don't understand fully. And, uh, and that's also the part why do some people recover and don't recover. 
So I'm, I, I will defer to others on the panel to actually add to that, but I think there's a lot that we don't know. And uh, the only drug that we have that's uh, in that period of uh, what they refer to as a cytokine storm is the uh, dexamethasone that's uh, showing uh, quite a lot of benefits. But other than that, we've tested and evaluated a lot of drugs. Uh, the antiretroviral remdesivir is useful very early on. So, so this is because it's a disease from head to toe. Uh, in some places, we're seeing more vascular involvement. It's very hard to pinpoint and say, okay, if you have this combination of uh, comorbidities and COVID-19, this is going to lead to, I, 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 I haven't un, uh, seen anything that can tell us with great uh, precision that this is what leads to worse outcomes or not. Is there somebody who wants to add something very short, very quick? Otherwise, I would just hand over to the next question or would go to the next question because we have a lot. <laughs> um, which role, to Salif, um, this question, um, which role do traditional medicine healers and alternative practitioners play in Africa and Europe in the current COVID-19 crisis? So this is a very interesting question, and um, I do believe that WHO has, uh, you know, um, put a working uh, technical working group on how there might be the use of um, traditional medicine. But I think this is very limited, and uh, we are all learning because this is a very new disease. We didn't know it before, and it's totally different what we used to see in Africa: Ebola, uh, malaria, TB, all these things. And uh, I think um, the, the, as in developed countries, uh, traditional medicine in the near future might be able to explore and trying to see what we, we, we can do for these very deadly uh, diseases. Thanks a lot. Um, there's another question to Wand Watson. Compared to well-developed countries, the death rate in Ethiopia is relatively low. Nutritionally, we are undernourished, our health system is very weak, we don't have enough experts in respiratory medicine, we have defiancy in multiple directions and hundreds of thousands of people living positively with HIV. Uh, how do you explain this condition? Yes, this is a very important question, but we have to bear in mind that we haven't yet come to the peak so I think the cumulative number of cases, you know, dying from severe COVID. Right now, I don't hear you. I don't know if I'm the only one who isn't hearing you or... Um, I don't hear what... you either. No. Okay, so... Now we, hear me? now we, we, I think we can hear you again. Do you want to have a second try? You may need to switch off the video, then it yeah. might be better. Yeah. Problem of connectivity. Yeah, yeah. I'm back. Really? We're back. We are, we are hearing you. <laughs> okay. So I, I was just saying that it is too, too early to say that, you know, the case fatality rate is, uh, you know, I don't think it's in any way different from what is seen in other countries particularly because, uh, you know, we have younger population and among the, the, those who are seriously ill admitted to the hospital, you know, the proportion of patients who have comorbidities like severe hypertension, diabetes, and then the like are, aren't, aren't proportionately high enough. So I think what I believe is we haven't yet come to the peak of the disease. So the cumulative number of cases dying from severe COVID will definitely increase. But what we have seen now is relatively the mortality rate is low. I haven't compared it to other African countries, but I think it is similar. And now our knowledge of using dexamethasone, prone positioning, and early, you know, early you know, use of oxygen. And you know, we have really, improved in, in our care to patients affected with severe and critical COVID, you know, compared to, 
you know, the time when COVID was reported in March. Now we have lots of experience. We use anticoagulants, we use anti-inflammatory agents, and, and the way we administer oxygen, non-invasive ventilation and the like. So, and, and these all contribute to, to the low mortality that we see. But I think, you know, it's too early to conclude that, you know, in Ethiopia, the mortality rate is, is lower compared to other, other similar African countries because we haven't yet come to the peak of, of the epidemic. Thank you. Okay, but thank you. I have a small point to that, and that is that, I mean, the situation in Ethiopia, if I understand it correctly, and certainly other parts of Africa I know better, uh, is almost the reverse of what's happening in Western Europe, where we have an aging population with lots of morbidities, comorbidities, multiple morbidities, define them as you will. Uh, and these are the people who are dying in our country uh, when they develop COVID-19. I mean, it's, it's even the young people who are dying have significant comorbidities. So it's, it's that pattern in the population that you've got to look at the demographics of the whole nation to, before you say, ah, yes, people are doing much better or much worse. Why is that? I think, in fact, multi-morbidity explains quite a bit of that difference. Thanks a lot, Peter, for adding your thoughts. Um, just um, always tell me if somebody wants to add something, I will be happy <laughs> to hand it over to you um, um, too. I have another question uh, to Salif. Will, uh, will countries be forced to compete for the available vaccines or will the AU play a role in the even distribution of what becomes available? And what role could um, WHO and other NGOs play in this process? It's a long question. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think this is a very important question. Uh, and, um, uh, and as we mentioned, this COVID-19, uh, you know, some positive aspect is the the necessity of having this global solidarity. And uh, today we are all talking about vaccine. If you look at the, uh, the, the European Union, they are trying to have the uh, access to, to, to the vaccine. The North American country, Canada, United States, the same. So what about the uh, uh, developing countries in Africa in particular? And that's why I said that this was the opportunity for the Gavi in Geneva with WHO and other big foundation, the Bill and Minnie the Gate Foundation, uh, put money for the, uh, having a vaccine for developing countries, the COVAX vaccine uh, initiative. COVAX is a, the international vaccine, is a very interesting uh, financial mechanism where developed countries will put you know, their uh, uh, contribution to buy a vaccine for developing countries. So we, to be sure that we in developing country will have access at the same time like in developed country. Of course, this will take time, maybe in 20, the second quarter of uh, 2021, but there is hope at least we have this mechanism in place to ensure uh, equity, global solidarity um, for, 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 for this one. And I, I said, nobody, uh, is safe until everyone is safe. And I think this is a guiding pr pr principle. And it was very interesting during the G20 meeting uh, last week in Saudi Arabia. This was also one of key topic, how to support developing countries. And we are very hopeful that this one will be COVID-19, uh, as <laughs> Professor Stefan said, and Croatia is really a democratic disease and will help also the developed and developing country. But I just want to add that we need in developing country to start now making the planning, not waiting until having the vaccine to think how to make the distribution, how to deal with the different challenges in terms of uh, cold change, uh, who need to be vaccinated in priority. We need a national framework written on dealing uh, in very a good description on how we will manage the stock of the vaccine in a very ethic, uh, equitable way and um, uh, you know respecting the, the different aspects in our daily life this is also very very important thank you thank you and i see stefan wants to add something I would like to add just yes covax is an important uh, instrument by davi cp and who 
Um, it's a 15 billion US dollar project, but it is two, less than 2 billion doses, meaning 800 uh, million doses for the high income countries, 800 million for the low income countries, low middle income countries, which is insufficient. So we have to work hard to get more of that. Um, it, it is a good, not to be misunderstood, it's, um, it's a, a very good and advanced market commitment project of Gavi has been translated very well there. I would just like to mention we need more. This is insufficient and it will also take more time. Uh, to my knowledge, the amount of uh, financial support has not completed, it is not completely filled yet, the 15 billion. I hope it will, but there will be delays. Also, we heard already there's minus 70 degree vaccine of BioNTech Pfizer. There will be some issues, but there are other vaccines. Um, I see a, on a higher level, I see some discrepancy. There will be the vaccines like the um, AstraZeneca vaccine, low cost that go there, and then the high cost RNA vaccines, which are complicated also. Um, we have to see how that works out. I think we still have to be active that this really will take place. There are other mechanisms like the approach Gates, uh, Bill Gates and um, the Serum Institute in India have already had, uh, have already their contract to full direct Gavi's deployment for low income countries and the, um, um, the Serum Institute of India, which also produces our vaccine against TB, are clearly the largest producer of doses in the world because they always have the lowest cost. So I think we should search and um, exploit other pathways in addition, although COVAX clearly is, if it turns out to work, as we all hope, is a very important step forward. Thanks so much. Time is running, but we are having a last question that goes out to Croatia. How can scientists and science academies advise politics and society on coping with COVID and multimorbidity? So I think um, that they have a very important role to play. And I think in many countries that have mounted good responses, um, it has been through establishing advisory committees and drawing on the scientific expertise that's there. Uh, I think in other countries, there has been good signs, but there's been a disconnect with political leadership. And so I think we've constantly seeing this tension between leadership and, and, and where, um, uh, what, what advice is being provided. I should also caution that, uh, you know, we say follow the science, but there's not a lot of science there uh, because it's all very new, it's evolving, it's changing. And I think that um, there's a third partner that's really important, which is the public. And, um, you know, this type of forum, for example, helps us to learn to communicate better the complexities of the scientific method and where we have uncertainty, how do we reach consensus. And at the same time, we have this huge mechanism and platform now of misinformation. <laughs> So there's, uh, you know, the things that we need to do, how we need to do it, when we need to do it, uh, also is uh, being counteracted with incredibly strong um, mechanisms through social media platforms. And, and trying to balance that is, is a real challenge. So I think all around, we, while we love for science to be at the center and more evidence-based decision-making in the case of this uh, disaster situation, we're facing something new, we're learning as we go, knowledge is changing, and then we're trying to deal with politics and where politics uh, sometimes manipulates the science and then ignores the science. And then at the same time, while you're trying to get some, um, uh, some common uh, important messages out uh, to the public, what to do, what not to do, we have a counter for. So uh, I think at the end of the day, we see the best um, and the worst of humanity at different levels, but that doesn't mean we should give up. We have to keep trying and hopefully truth will prevail 
and for scientists to constantly speak truth to power may not always be easy, but we have to persevere and persist. Thank you so much. We have never, uh, we are never, never going to give up. <laughs> That's for sure. Thank you so much for all of your answers, for all of the smart questions, dear audience. Um, unfortunately, we are limited in time. So right now, I um, would like to close this amazing panel uh, discussion with some brief concluding remarks by our experts or from our experts. Um, what are the key messages you can share with us? And I would uh, like to propose that we stick to our order. So Karesha, would you like to start? So I'd like to remind ourselves of um, in the context of a pandemic, our in interdependence and that there is no room for nationalism because as long as we have one infection anyway, every one of us is at risk. Thank you. That was very quick, thanks. Um, let's stick with uh, our order again. So what do you want us to think about again? What wasn't? Yeah, this is a new disease and we are learning about it every day. So research is a key to answer number of questions. So we have to be really open-minded. And now we are coming across you know, post-COVID phenomenon, which we haven't seen before. So this is an area where we have, we all, the academia has to be actively engaged in doing, in doing research. Thank you. Thank you. Peter, do you have a key message for our audience? Uh, yes, I think it is that, surprisingly, multimorbidity is really important. Multimorbidity is one of the big predictors of outcome with COVID-19 infections. And what you need to understand is how multimorbidity where you live interacts with that infection and how it interacts with the effectiveness of all the measures you're using, but particularly, obviously, vaccination. So developing ways of quantifying or at least thinking about multimorbidity, whether it's in clinical practice or whether it's a matter of collecting data at a national level is going to be one of the major developments that comes from this epidemic. Thanks a lot. Salif, are there any recommendations left? I can't hear you. Can you switch on your microphone? Turn yes. On? Thank you. Yes, I'm sorry. Just uh, three uh, ideas. The first one is, uh, you know, this COVID-19 show us how we are very vulnerable as human beings, globally speaking. So <laughs> I think this, as I said, the global solidarity was the one. The second is, you know, the importance of uh, public-private partnership, um, allowing today to have access to this vaccine in a very short time. This is the first time in the history of medicine. And the third aspect is the, the science and technology behind all this development. You know, I think COVID-19 was an opportunity to develop, to use science and technology. And I do believe after COVID, we might be able to use the same platform to make advance for other uh, diseases like HIV, malaria, and TB, and other diseases. And I would like to finish by um, one idea that was developed by Croatia, the what we call the infodemic, infodemic, dissemination of disinformation and misinformation. This is very, very, very bad. And it is up to us, academic, working with government, working with communities to, uh, you know, uh, say this is, these are fake news and we need really to educate our communities. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Stefan, what about you? What should be our takeaway from today? Well, I think there are three issues which I would like to stress and some others have already talked about that too. We need to do everything that we get the novel interventions to everybody, notably the vaccines for COVID-19. Second, we have to take care that this momentum is, uh, remains and is sustainable and that uh, other diseases, TB, HIV, malaria, neglected tropical diseases, will not suffer from the COVID um, uh, crisis. And the third thing is, let's look 
forward really, and I want to stress this again, um, I said it before, we need international transparent intervention and surveillance mechanisms that stop an outbreak at its root before it becomes an epidemic or a pandemic. Thanks a lot. Thanks for providing the possibility to discuss in more depth the complexity of this pandemic of COVID-19 and multimorbidity. I hope we will continue to share thoughts, to listen to each other and to be interested in solutions for the best of everybody. If you want to listen to our renowned speakers again, dear audience, there will be a recording of the event available as a video upload on YouTube. So just watch out, you'll find the link uh, to that video on leopoldina.org. Thank you, our panelists, for your input and a huge thank you to, your, uh, to our audience. Thanks for attending, asking questions. Goodbye, stay safe and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Bye.